This is the Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast brought to you by Art Wiederman, CPA with Ide Bailey. Whether it's taxes and investing or planning wisely, Art is the expert to make your dental practice profitable. At Ide Bailey, what inspires you inspires us. We provide a suite of accounting and advisory services dedicated to the total care of your practice. Visit our website to access our tools and resources tailored for dentists, idebailey.com slash dentist. That's E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com slash dentist. This podcast is distributed with the understanding that Art Wiederman, CPA, and I Bailey LLP are not rendering legal, accounting, or other professional advice. Listeners should consult with their business advisors before acting on any of the information or opinions shared. If you have questions and or feedback, make sure to email Art over at awiederman at idebailey.com. That's A-W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y dot com. You can also give Art a call at 657-279-3243. Without further delay, here's your host, Dental CPA, Art Wiederman. And hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Dental Finance and Management with Art Wiederman, CPA. I'm your host, Art Wiederman. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, It is late September here. We're about... uh, Oh my gosh, believe it or not, we're six months into this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and we're time stamping our podcasts and uh, keeping our fingers crossed that things are, are getting better. I, I will give you my weekly update of where I see the dental profession going. I am seeing everybody is still doing pretty well. I am seeing some folks uh, uh, with a little bit of a pullback in the fourth quarter because of all the pent up demand and the you know, once we reopen the dental offices and my objective in, in this podcast, going through this pandemic is to provide you lots of tools and resources to help keep your practice growing and bringing it back stronger than ever. Uh, my guest today is going to be Daniel Larson, who's a principal product manager at Henry Shine One. He's out of American Fork, Utah. And we're, we're going to be talking about um, five things in your dental practice that should be automated, but that are probably aren't and why they should be and some really good tips and tools and what's going on in the industry. Um, I do want to let you know that uh, uh, our podcast today is uh, sponsored by Henry, uh, is sponsored today by Dentrix Ascend by Henry Shine One. Uh, Dentrix Ascend moves practice management to the cloud, meaning dental teams can access their practice data at any time from any location on any device. It simplifies the management of group practices, providing a central database and business reporting for the group while allowing individual sites the flexibility that they need. So thank you to um, Henry Shine One and Dentrix Ascent for sponsoring our podcast today. And Daniel and I are going to talk about what's going on in the industry as far as things you can do with your software and in your practice um, that will allow you... um, to, to you know, have less people processes and, and more production in, in your in your practice. So we'll get to Daniel in a moment. A um, couple things I do want to share is um, uh, take a look at our partner, uh, Decisions in Dentistry uh, magazine, www.decisionsindentistry.com. Uh, uh, take a look at their annual sc- subscription membership for their over 140 continuing education courses. Some of the courses are cone beam imaging and oral facial therapy, applicability of acupuncture and dentistry, and uh, coronavirus transmission in the dental setting, which obviously is very prevalent today. So take a look at that. Uh, If you're looking for a dental CPA anywhere in the United States, our partner, the Academy of Dental CPAs, www.adcpa.org, 24 CPA firms across the country that represent over 9,000 dentists. So uh, real quickly, uh, what's my update with what's going on with all these new laws? I have no update. Uh, <laughs> I wish I had an update for you folks. Um, we are now uh, recording today on September the 16th. That means Congress is going to be in Washington for about another two weeks. Uh, I'm talking regularly to my good friend, uh, Megan Mortimer from the American Dental Association. She's the, uh, uh, she is their uh, lobbyist, their congressional lobbyist. 
Um, apparently, there is a group of, I believe it is either 20, I thought it was 25, um, you know, Republican and Democratic congressmen and women who are all moderates who have gotten together and have put together a middle of the road package to put in front of everybody else that seems to be things that everybody could agree on. Megan is not real sure whether that's going to go anywhere, but it's going to be introduced into, I believe, the Senate today. It's going to have a second round of PP, uh, PPP. Uh, it's going to have other things. And we're really hoping that Congress gets around to making the, um, you know, for anybody for under $150,000 for their PPP loans that they will be forgiven with a simple one-page attestation. So my advice to you folks is there is no rush unless you're potentially selling your practice in the next month or two. There is absolutely no rush to file for forgiveness. If you file for forgiveness, I think you're taking a risk and you may, and again, if your loan's under 150000 which is more than 85% of the loans that were made, you may end up with a situation where you can just sign a page that says, all right, I really tried to follow the rules. Now leave me a loan and don't make me pay this money back. And that's basically what it's going to be. Uh, we're also waiting for HHS guidance on the reporting requirements. Uh, we had podcasts about that, and I will keep you posted on that. So with that said, let's go ahead and get to our guest, uh, Daniel Larson. Uh, from Henry Shine One, welcome to the Art of Dental Finance and Management. Hey, Art, great to be here. Thanks for thanks for having me. Well, thank you for coming on. So, uh, Daniel, you're up in Utah now. We've got that's pretty darn smoky here in Southern California. Uh, I've never seen a sun that's been this orange for this long. And and again, my heart <laughs> and my thoughts just for everyone to know. Uh, not only goes out to all the people here in California, Oregon, and Utah, uh, Oregon and Washington, who have gone through these horrible, horrible wildfires. Uh, we've got one here in, in a town called Monrovia. Uh, that is um, that's the that, that's the biggest one we have here in Southern California, but uh, it's pretty bad. Our heart goes out to all the people who have lost their lives, loved ones, homes, thousands and thousands of homes. Um, uh, as well as the uh, hurricane that's uh, unfortunately hitting the Gulf Coast today uh, is, is also causing havoc. So again, our hearts and prayers uh, out to all of you. Um, are you seeing any any smoke or anything where you are in Utah, Daniel? Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that, Art. Actually, it, it had been pretty smoky here in Utah. And then just over this last weekend, um, I actually live in a town called Pleasant Grove, Utah. And we had a about a hundred acre fire a mile from me. So oh, wow. a lot of neighbors pretty, uh, you know, unsettled. And it's a, it's a scary thing. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, let, let's just, let's just hope and pray that this, this passes too. It's, uh, it's, it's not, not good stuff. So, so Dan, before we get going, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey. Um, you know, where, where did you come from in your career and how'd you get to Henry Shine one? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, so my, I started with Henry Schein in February, 2004 and I was, uh, 19 years old. Um, so I've, I've been with Henry Schein quite a, quite a while. I, I started in the support team and then I moved over to development and then to, to product. Uh, you know, I, while I was in development, I was, uh, going to school, uh, so it's been a, a long, fun, fun journey. And I've been part of the Ascend team since we, since we started that project, you know, it was kind of just an idea on a whiteboard. And so seeing it come to fruition and, and customers using it has been really uh, rewarding and, and a fun challenge these last, you know, six or, or seven years. Cool. Tell us some of the things that Henry Shine One does and we'll get into our topic. Yeah. So, so Henry Shine One, the, the concept with Henry Shine One is giving customers kind of a, a single user experience, pulling in all, there's so many different software products that, that practices need to effectively run uh, a dental practice. And so our goal is to give them kind of one solution, one-stop shop, all of it together and, and, and seamless. So you're not having to pull these different solutions together to try to make things make things work. So that's that's our goal with Intershun One. Okay. Well, let's start talking about the, our topic again today is the five functions in your practice that should be automated, but probably aren't. So the, the first one we're going to talk about is online booking. Now, 
I know you and I, 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 I've been in the dental industry, the dental profession, a little longer than you've been, uh, just a little bit. But um, what changes have, have you seen in, let's talk about consumer behavior. Because, you know, I mean, the old days, um, you know, we talked about the yellow page. I talked about the yellow pages. When I, when I lecture to the dental students at the different dental schools in Southern California, I always say to them, so how many of you find professional services from the yellow pages? And I, I actually bring a copy of an old yellow page book. And they all look at me like I'm, like, like I'm on, like, like maybe I've taken some too much medication or something because they don't know what the yellow pages are. So um, right. obviously, you know, in, in the old days, Daniel, you, you pick up the phone and you call a dental office and say, Hey, I want to get in, get my teeth clean. So how, what's yeah. changed in behavior in the past 10 years? Yeah. Well, I, I think that that point is a good one, you know, and, and I think, think back on like, well, how do, how do people, you know, not so much currently, but you know, how do people book airline travel, right? Like how many people are calling travel agents anymore, right? You do, you do that online. Um, I, you know, I were talking a, a little bit earlier about another example is, is Uber, you know, uh, I looked up some, some stats and uh, in Q4 2019, uh, worldwide, Uber did 900 million rides in one month in Q4. That, that's uh, almost, last year. I'm an accountant and, and, and am required by law to use numbers. That's like almost <laughs> a billion rides, right? Yeah, yeah. Almost a billion rides in a, in a single month. And what's what's interesting about that is like if, if we were to get in a time machine, right, and go back like 10 or 15 years and try to tell someone about this idea, I think most people would find it crazy. Um, and so I think it just shows that um, consumer demand is going to, you know, uh, really drive the adoption of this of these types of technologies. And and consumers are they want self-service tools, right? Like Airbnb is another example. Tens of millions of reservations on Airbnb every month. But when we maybe to go back to dental practices, um, you know, how many dental practices offer online booking for their patients? Percentage wise, it's not a lot. It's not it's a not, lot. It's not. I mean, and you probably, you guys, Henry Schein works at, I, the last statistics I saw, somewhere between 40 and 50,000 practices in the United States, maybe more. I don't know. Yeah. 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 50,000 practices across our different uh, solutions. And, and yeah, we, we do see that those, those numbers are pretty low. But what's, what's really interesting to me is the practices who are, um, maybe a little more progressive on introducing these types of technologies in the practice. They're generally really successful with them. So we have a number of customers who have patients booking, you know, they're getting uh, several hundred appointments per month through online booking. If you think about it, like, um, cause we don't, I mean, generally like we wouldn't recommend, right. We're not, we're not thinking that patients are going to go onto your website and tell, tell you the dentist that they need a root canal. That's not really the use case. The use case is a new patient needs an appointment, right? Or an existing patient needs to book for um, for hygiene, right? For a cleaning. Those are the use cases where we see a lot of a lot of value. It's less about I'm going to schedule and tell the dentist I need a crown type of a type of scenario. So, so Daniel, if I have a practice that is not using this tool, okay, um, you can't just flip a switch one day and just say I'm not going to take any more phone calls. I mean, how, how do you, how do you get a practice that is in the uh, 18th century? Um, mm -hmm. I still actually have a couple of clients who have pegboard accounting systems and don't use a computer software management program. I, I, I know that's hard to believe. You've probably seen some of them, but how do we, yeah. how do we go from uh, the only way to make an appointment in my dental office is to pick up the phone and, and call to uh, to an online booking is there some training to of the patient how, how do you how do you get them to change yeah, yeah that's a great great question it's, it's funny you mentioned those older systems when i when i first started with henry shine that first year we still had a number of customers on our easy dental dos product and they loved it and really didn't want to give it up so changes change is hard but i think the way that you can make that transition you know um is First, you need a tool that's going to allow you to do that, right? And and that's kind of where that idea of Henry Shen One I think is is valuable, where it's like all these tools working together. But in terms of like, no matter what tool you use, the the process of how you go about making the changes is is important. And so I would I would say you know make a recommendation like start with just new patient appointments, 
or start with just recare appointments. If you're if you're interested in doing online booking for your patients, but you're kind of not sure where to start, I would say start start small. Maybe you just offer one day a week that's available for new patients to book, right? Because um, I've heard a lot of a lot of dental practices, you know, talk about well, I don't want to lose control, um, right? So you need to need to be able to control when they can schedule and all those all those types of things. But I think in terms of where to start, I start small and 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 find out where it works and where it doesn't and make make adjustments. I, I mean, they actually do have control because they will be able to set up the online and maybe talk a little bit about mechanically how this works. So you, you don't just basically say, okay, here's eight hours, patient. You just do whatever you want to do. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I exactly. mean, how, how does this mechanically work? Does the, the, the practice puts certain slots for hygiene and, and, and operative and, and restorative? How does that work? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think different different tools are going to work in different ways. Um, but I'm glad you asked that question because I think a, a lot of times when practices first hear that idea, they 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 are afraid and they think, oh, you know, exactly what you said. Patient, we don't want patients to be able to book anything they want at any time. And so, I think mechanically, at least with with Ascend, you know, our our product, um, the practice can be really um, granular about their configuration. They can choose the days and times, the providers, the appointment types that they want to make available. And then one of the the cool things that we that we do is we keep that in sync with their um, practice schedule. So if appointments get booked in the office, right? We're not going to show those times online. And so it's all kept in sync together in real time. And the practice can be really, again, have tons of configuration around what they want to open and what what they don't want to open. So if you're going to switch, Daniel, from uh, non-online booking to online booking, do you send a letter to the patients? Do you send them an email to say, hey, guys, we have this new tool available? Is there is there like a uh, you know, because again, everybody's real busy, and some people like me are not the most computer literate human beings on the planet. So, I mean, how, how do you how do you actually let patients know? By the way, we're doing this new deal called online booking. Yeah, and I think I, I think online booking is probably supplemental. You know, I, I don't see the the phone calls to the practice going away completely, but it's just giving them options. And so, in terms of like, how do you make the make the transition as a as a practice? I think it depends a little bit on 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 what your goals are. So, for example, if if uh, bringing in new patients is a key for you, right? You'll want to make are the, you know, the online booking tool available on your website, right? If you are, are doing a lot with Instagram or Facebook or different social media channels, you want to make that link to that online booking page available to them. The practices that we see on, on Ascend that are most successful are honestly, and they're, they're putting marketing money behind it as well. They're, they're informing their patients that this is an option that they can go to and, and do on their site. And so I think, you know, get it on your site, get it on your social media, especially if new patients are a, a priority for you. If you're looking at it as a way to uh, online booking as a, like a retention tool, right, for bringing patients back in for, for hygiene, um, have it have that online booking tool tied in with your appointment reminders, right? Most practices are sending email and text appointment reminders for, for recare when patients are due. Uh, with the send, for example, you know, we'll, we'll automatically put a, a button on there so patients can click that and then go schedule their own appointment online. And then, if, and then of course, you know, talk to your patients about it. Let them know that it's an, that it's an option and to, and to look out for it. I, I think those are probably the places I would start. So you, you you were talking about you know consumer behavior changing and Uber and I, I have a great story is is when I moved to California in 1975, um, I started banking at a bank that no longer exists called Glendale Federal Savings, and they had the first ATM machine, the automated teller machine, and I went and I said, so how does this work? Yeah, this is the the bank manager says, yeah, this is brand new. This is the first one in the in the country. Um, and it was really great, but um, you can you can de- make deposits, you can get cash out. I mean, I don't have to go to the teller and get cash out. Yeah, and the guy says, but you know, it's a fad; it'll never last. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> right, said to me. right, right. Is, you know, forty five <laughs> years ago and stuff. But so, do do you see patients uh, again? Because you guys deal with like thousands of practices. Do, do you guys see patients? Still, if they want to go to a practice, are they willing without calling the office to just, they've been referred to the office, they know they want to go to the office. 
are they willing to just make an appointment without making a phone call at all? Or do they still want to pick up the phone call and say, Hey, um, uh, you know, I, I'd like to talk to you know, this Dr. Smith's office, tell them about your office. What, what kind of trends are you seeing with that? Yeah, generally, I would say that over time, the number of patients who are willing to do that's only going to increase to your to your story earlier, right? I don't think it's a, a trend or, or a fad. And, and there over time, more and more and more um, patients are, are going to be, you know, willing to do that. Um, I think you can tell a lot about a practice by their website about, you know, what does it look like inside? Who is the, who is the doctor, right? All these things. I can learn quite a bit. And maybe, you know, if we, if we rewind back 20 years or whatever, before most practices had a, had a website, you could probably learn more today from a practice about their website than you could maybe from the white pages or from, uh, you know, from uh, just the yellow them, pages. No, no, no. The white yellow pages is, the white pages is where you find people's <laughs> phone numbers. The yellow pages right. is where the businesses are. The business why, why don't you know right. that? I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. That was kind of transitioning, uh, transitioning out as I was growing up. <laughs> That's right. That's right. So, so why do you think you, you see a lot of dental practices that are maybe resistant to going to this online booking? Why, why do you think that's the case? And, um, uh, you know, where do you see them being slow to adapt to all these changes? Yeah, well, I think I think the first one we talked a little bit about is just maybe fear of change or, or not knowing how to go how to go about it. Um, but I also think that it's again it's it's important to think about where things where are things headed and and how can we as a practice uh, adapt to that. Um, so I think one is just kind of again uh, fear of the of the unknown, and then also is maybe not knowing. What tools are out there that are available and, and how they would work. And then the, the last thing, I kind of mentioned this already, is maybe practices are kind of comfortable. They don't feel like they need to do it. Yep. But but one thing one thing I would maybe um, have your listeners consider is, you know, most practices, again, will send email or text reminders that uh, like a cleaning appointment, you know, the, the patient do, not scheduled, but do. What happens if Art gets that email at eight o'clock at night and the practice is closed and there's no online booking, what happens? It doesn't yep. get scheduled, right? You get busy because you've got a million things going on. And the next thing you know, it's been a year since you've been into the practice. And so even though you may not be open as a practice 24 seven online booking makes it so that you are available to your patients kind of anytime, anywhere. Or, or what happens if art is stupid enough to, um, introduce his cell phone to a cup of coffee that spills on the table like he did on <laughs> Sunday. So Art is without a cell phone for a week. Now, part of me is like, oh my God, how am I going to survive? And the other one says, boy, this is actually pretty cool. I don't have a cell phone. But um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Disconnect for a while, right? <laughs> Disconnect for a while. That's right. I can't. Uh, we won't go there. Anyway. All right. So so let's move on to, to the, the second function in your practice that should be automated. And that's, that's forms. Okay. So, yeah. uh, you know, we've got COVID-19 has happened. What kind of trends are, is Henry Schein seeing uh, from behavior, you know, customer behavior because of COVID-19? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think that, um, you know, we talked about practices being comfortable before kind of having a, a process that they're, that they're used to, um, you know, Online booking, we, we talked about, is probably like a little bit lower adoption. There, there are fewer practices overall. I think forms, more practices are doing that digitally now. Um, and COVID really pushed that forward. So one of the trends that, that we saw was, you know, since since COVID happened, we saw like a 5x increase in the number of forms. I mean, it was just, we had those few weeks in March where things were kind of crazy and a lot of practices were closed. But as practices came back online, came back open, the number of forms, I mean, Week after week, the total number, we just broke all time records for number of uh, digital forms submitted, which makes which makes sense. I think if you're not if you're not doing your forms digitally today, if you still have the old clipboard and, and paper, look for a form solution. There are lots of lots of great ones out there. You should def. This is one I think if, if the patient shows up to your practice and you have a clipboard and paper they're they're not going to be impressed with that with that process at this point and so again if you're if you're you might be a little bit behind if you're still using paper on this one but there's tons of great form digital form solutions out there um i think the best ones 
you know, work with your practice management software and with your appointment reminders and kind of all fit together. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's been a huge, huge trend. COVID kind of pushed that, pushed that ahead a couple of years, I think, and forced some practices out of their comfort zone with that. I, I mean, think about the amount of time that someone at the front desk, not only for new patients, but also for patients who you need updated health history, right? That's what we use this for, Daniel? Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, think about the amount of time that your office can save by, by, by doing this. And, and now, you know, doctors, a lot of you are sitting there listening to this and saying, yeah, yeah, I know I do this or no, I'm not going to change it. But I will tell you that even from an old dog like me, Getting automated in in some of the things that that I've done in, in in the CPA practice has been unbelievable. I mean, an unbelievable opportunity to save time. And I wish I was born. <laughs> maybe I wish I was born thirty years later, so I would have all these skills that my kids <laughs> have and that Daniel has and stuff like that. So, all right. So, any anything else about forms you want to talk about? That's pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, yeah, I think that's straightforward. Again, m I think most practices have made that transition. If you haven't, it's time. All right, Daniel, we're in the middle here. Why don't you give give out your information? If anybody's got any questions about uh, uh, these digital solutions and, and what's working in dental practices, again, Henry Shine, Henry Shine One, uh, yeah. they're the biggest. They work with the most number of practices. They're, I, I know a lot of their people. Their people are awesome, just like Daniel. Uh, how would someone get a hold of you, Daniel? Uh, email address and a phone number, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, so you can contact me directly at daniel.larsen, L-A-R-S-E-N, at henryshine1.com. And you can learn more about Ascend at dentrixascend.com. Okay. Is there a phone number they can call you at? Yeah, sure. 801-833-3744. Okay, great. All right, let's let's talk about patient router and workflow. What, where do you see, you know, a lot of these processes and practices haven't changed in the last 20 years. Where do you see the issues and, 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 and what are the solutions that people should be looking at as far as workflow compliance and, the, and, and patient router? Yeah, well, I, I think, you know, thinking back on these last uh, 15 years or so, there've been so many, and this goes back further, but there've been, some really cool advancements in dentistry, right? Like CAD CAM and all kinds of cool stuff. Um, but as a as kind of a, a tech person, whenever I visit customers and I see paper, that's like opportunity for like process improvement. But one of the things that I still see a lot of that I that I find interesting is um, the patient routing slip. Um, tons of practices, right? We'll still print that out and it follows the patient around in their visit and, you know, uh, assistant will get it and write some stuff on it. The doctor will, and then it finds its way back to, up to the front office. And so that, that kind of patient, patient route or that, that paper that, that follows the patient around, I still see quite a, quite a bit of that. Um, I, I do so, too. Yeah. 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 It's, it's one of those things that's, that's stuck around and I, I think it has some utility, right? Which is why people still... Uh, still do that. So one of the things that we, you know, when we built Ascend, we we thought, okay, we want to, we don't want to just build Dentrix on the cloud. We want to kind of like reimagine, like how what's next generation practice management. And so one of the things we tried to do was say, well, how can we take that really popular piece of paper that follows the patient around and make that a digital experience for the practice? Um, and so we we introduced this this concept of a digital router. So as the patient goes through their visit, right at the beginning, we care about how many uh, missed appointments have they had. What's their contact information if they're running late, right? Who's the primary contact if it's an appointment for a kid? All those types of things. But then as we move into you know the patient moves into the chair. Right. And it's the clinical team. Then we care about well, what are we seeing them for today? And, um, you know, do they have any medical alerts and all that kind of stuff? And so rather than having one piece of paper that has all of that on it with with the send, one of the things we did is said, let's make that digital. And it adapts as you go through that through that uh, uh, that patient journey. And so anyway, that's kind of one one place where we try to say, hey, how can we. How can we make this? How can we make this different? How can we get rid of the paper? So, so a lot, of, a lot of operatories that I've gone into, a lot of dental offices have uh, two computer screens. One is going to be up where the the dentist can show the patient what's going on and have the dim, d the images. We're going to have imaging here in a second. Um, 
And the other one is kind of right behind uh, in the back of the uh, treatment room. Uh, usually I've seen it above the uh, rear delivery where all the hand pieces are. And, and you can have yeah. the assistant typing in on the routing. Is, is that how it pretty much works? Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of that information will just update automatically. So as the patient's going through, uh, that information will um, will change. But exactly right. As the as the patient comes into the chair, right, then the context is different and 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 the send will kind of update automatically to show you the relevant information. Okay. All right. Let's go to let's go to item number four. Time flies when you're having fun, Daniel. Um, <laughs> let's talk about imaging. Now I mean, I, I, I tell this story, I, I probably told it on this podcast, folks, and, and, is that I, the first time I ever spoke at the California Dental Association Convention was in 1989. So that is, let me do the math, 11 and 20, 31 years ago. And at the 1989 uh, CDA convention, Daniel, the first intraoral video camera for dentistry was introduced. It was manufactured by Fuji the mm -hmm. film people. And it was probably as big as a dental operatory, maybe two. And it cost $42,000. <laughs> <laughs> right. And everybody was going, Ooh, ah, wow, this is crazy. Yeah. So obviously we didn't have a whole lot of dental imaging back then, but we do now. So, so, so you're going to talk about imaging, but what, what's coming I mean, you know, obviously the technology is just going to keep changing and evolving and getting better. I mean, I had I had David Hornbrook speak at our Academy of Dental CPA meeting. Uh, I think it was fifteen, you know, yeah, fifteen years ago, two thousand five, and he said that in ten years there would not be dental impression material anymore. Mm -hmm. We're not quite there, but we're getting close. So, what kind of trends do you see as far as imaging and 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 where it's going? I mean, it's it's obviously getting to be big. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that one of the one of the areas for opportunity that, that we see where there, there's going to be a lot of change is um, kind of the merging of practice management software with with imaging. I think for a long time there's just been kind of this basic integration where they talk to each other, but there's so many missed opportunities when you have two different, you know, right? You have your imaging solution and your practice management are separate, and so I think that. Bringing those together, having a, a, a single solution that, that can handle both sides, right? The clinical imaging as well as kind of the traditional practice management, charting and ledger and those things. I think that's going to be uh, that's going to be a huge, huge trend because I think people have kind of come to accept where things have been and just, uh, you know, say, well, that's that's how they work. That's, you know, but as you see better examples and how it could be right imaging and practice management together then i think customer expectations will will, will really will really uh change so, uh, what, so that's, what, that's one place what's the benefit to the practice of, of merging those two things so one one benefit is uh, you know if you if you think for example that you capture your images right out of your imaging software but then how does your practice management software know that that should go in the ledger that you should bill for it Somebody has to remember and they uh, don't. Right. So another thing would be, you know, if you if you uh, had four bite wings taken today, right, your imaging software knows about that. But how does your practice management software? It doesn't. With the send, it does. But with a lot of systems, right, because they're separate, they don't talk to each other in that way. But when they're one solution, you get all these really cool cool benefits of the two products working together as a single product. So we could be losing revenues because of the fact that we did a procedure and it was done through imaging, but the management software, it never gets to the management software is what you're saying, right? Yeah, exactly. We did, we did some, uh, some research and we found, I think it was about 30% of x-rays that are taken are never billed, not because the practice didn't want to, but because of those inefficiencies by having separate products. Now I, I know with imaging, it's, it, it, I mean, I've been, you know, I, I've, I've seen, imaging systems. I've been to the different uh, places to, to, to see them. And I know that artificial intelligence uh, has some potential in dentistry. I know um, 
they they use it in um, you know in in lots of different instances in, in dentistry. One of which is is looking at metrics. Uh, there's actually a metrics program out there that that can actually go into the software and tell you, okay, here are the ten patients that are more most likely to accept your treatment, make the appointment, and pay for it. I mean, mm-hmm. it's amazing. So talk about how artificial intelligence it would work in dentistry and, and, and also in regards to caries detections. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that there's a, a big opportunity and I think we're really early on, you know, and kind of that, that product life cycle. I think we're just at the very beginning of, of artificial intelligence, um, at least in, in dentistry, but there are a number of, uh, of companies that are doing some really impressive stuff. Like you said, with, uh, being able to send um, an image through this algorithm and have the software be able to um, kind of help the help the dentist know maybe some areas that they they perhaps could have missed right where caries is 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 present um, and so there's some really exciting products that are that are coming out in this in this area and I think we're just at the very beginning of of understanding like how is that how is this technology really going to to fit into dentistry? Is it that second opinion and giving the doctor another set of eyes? Um, is it taking those things that the software finds on the image and automatically charting them and saving time there? Is it making it so that insurance claims get paid faster? Because we know that there's caries on this tooth and it's been verified by, by AI, right? Rather than the insurance company looking at x-rays, having a, a, a system that will do that. So I think we're really early on with this, but I, I definitely think that artificial intelligence, you know, over the next 10 years, 15 years, is going to be become a kind of a normal part of practice management software and what the what the practice has in their toolkit. So so right now if someone wanted a an imaging solution, they would they would buy one uh, and 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 it integrates with the practice management software, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that's what we're really early on with because most of the most of the AI imaging software will have kind of a basic integration. Um, but part of our mission with Henry Shen One, right, is that single single solution and and having it all work together as one as one product. And so we're we're at the uh, exciting early stages of that now. Exciting early stages. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's like exciting early stages of preparing a tax return. No, that's not exciting at all. <laughs> and then I know that 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 you know you work with you guys work with a lot of DSOs and larger group practices. And for those of you that are looking at, uh, I'll use the term building your empire and building and acquiring or starting more practices. Um, how does that help in, in in the realm of growing a DSO? Yeah, I I think you know we. We certainly see that trend continuing. Um, I, I don't know that it's ever going to be, uh, you know, 100 percent, but but growth of DSOs is, is certainly certainly happening. And and so what we what we see a lot of a lot of customers that that come to us say, I've been you know we've been using this tool that works great for a single practice, but now that we get to three, five, you know, nine, 15 practices, it just breaks. All right. So having a solution that's built for, for DSOs, right. You don't want your technology to be the reason that you can't scale your business. We see a lot of, a lot of practices that, you know, are, are on solutions that just don't scale up, can't handle, you know, 20, 50, a hundred locations or more. Um, and so that's why they, you know, a lot, a lot of practices will, will come to us. So yeah, I definitely see, you know, growth of DSOs continuing. Yep. It, it's uh, right now, I mean, the numbers I've heard is is you're somewhere in the low twenty percent. In other words, twenty to twenty five percent of the practices in the United States are part of a group. Now, again, a group could be there are there are companies that own a thousand practices, and there's companies that own two practices. And mm-hmm. so I'm I'm seeing twenty twenty five percent, probably heading towards maybe thirty. And I get into debates with people all the time. Well, it's going to be 50%. I go, I don't think so. I, I just, yeah. you know, I sell dental practices and I know that a lot of doctors who I go to to sell a practice 
are very, very cognizant of this and they, they, they won't, you know, they, they want to sell to another single owner and keep it as a single owner practice, but it is a big part of what's going on out there. It's a huge part of what's going on out there. All right, Daniel, let's, let's hit our number five, um, our number five solution, which has to do with payments. Uh, you know, payments are good things. As an accountant, accountants like payments. Payments are <laughs> revenue. Revenues are important. Go to the it's important. <laughs> That's right. There you go. You're learning. There you go. So, what what do you tell a dental office team member? Uh, and, and we get this too. That are set in their ways. Hygiene is set in their ways. Uh, so, what do you tell a team member? The concerned. Um, you know, not only that that the patients may not pay, but that maybe even they're going to lose job security. I mean, mm-hmm. talk about that for a minute. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we I, I've certainly talked with with customers over the years and say, well, if the product's going to do this, what am I going to what am I going to do? And and I've heard, you know, some not a lot, but I've heard some practices talk about, you know, wanting to go to a model where, you know, there's not a reception team and, and it's really pared down. And I just I don't know. I, I think there may be some of that. But but I don't I think that the goal for for our for our solutions and, and what we want to see is like I have a lot of empathy for people who work in dental practices. I think it's a hard job. There's so much to do. And so I, I don't I don't see it as a, you know, automation and technology is like taking people's jobs. I think it's more about freeing up team members so they can focus on the patients who are there so they can build a relationship with the person that's in front of them rather than fighting all of these manual tools and things that they things that they have because it, you know the technology and all of these things are great and it's going to help the business grow but i think a key to you know keeping keeping patients retaining and patient loyalty is the relationship you build with them as a person when they're there and that's what we and, want to help and i think i think folks that that you know cuz i run into this all the time and cuz i'm talking to our dentists all the time it's like well they don't want to change and they they i had one you know, one doctor who told me about, you know, six months ago, uh, well, I wanted to make these changes, but, but the team just said no. And so well, what does that mean? Well, well, they just said no. And I said, so they own the practice? No, I own the practice, but they said no. And, and I said, well, why did they say no? Well, they said no, because it, it would require change. And I said, so change is bad? Well, to them, it's bad. They like doing what they're doing. And this is textbook. And if I'm talking to you, please listen to me. Um, You know, I get lots of front office people who will, who I will talk to and they will just go, you know, Art, we we just can't handle anymore. I'm so busy at the front. I'm so busy dealing with this and routing slips and, um, you know, taking payments and, and all this stuff. And if they would just embrace Daniel, the, the, the technology and that it makes their life simple. And the other thing I think that's really important to note here, and I want to get your comment on this, is, you know, when I go into a business and I see that everything is automated and there's people there, I can still talk to a human being, all right, who's engaging. But right. when I can automate more of the stuff and it just makes my life so much easier and I don't have to spend more time on it, don't people like going into businesses where it's easier isn't that the, isn't that true yeah yeah absolutely right and and i think that it also gives an impression to to the patient it's like this practice knows what they're doing everything's organized if if my right, the whole experience matters is not the dentistry is the most important part but the other parts matter too right that whole experience gives the impression to the patient that this practice is organized and know that if if all these pieces are in place, then, then, you know, I'm going to get, you know, have a, have a great experience with them, with them overall. So I totally agree. So, so I know you've worked with a lot of different customers. Any, any, any war stories you can share with our audience? I always love war stories about how someone was like in the eight, you know, <laughs> they were in the Joan of Arc mode and uh, <laughs> now they had, I think they call it an epiphany. Uh, yeah. More syllables. That's more than I usually do, but I know that word epiphany. I think I learned it on Jeopardy <laughs> or something. Um, but anyway, any war, any stories of like you know, you you took a practice that was in the 14th century and you brought it in, and, and it's it's really improved. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we definitely have a, you know examples of you know customers who who have embraced these tools, and you know one one example is uh, we've helped practices move from like we we one of the things we measure is recare effectiveness, right? How if you had a hundred patients that were due for a cleaning this month, how many actually showed up? 
So we've helped practices move from like 30%, right? Pretty low bar uh, up to 60, 70% effectiveness using using these tools. In terms of uh, of, of uh, kind of old old technology, I just have to share a funny a funny story. This is a long time ago, but when I was when I was on the support team, we I had a customer I was working with to try to help them uh, solve a problem, and I asked them to send me a screenshot, right? Send me like a screenshot of you so I can see what you're seeing. This was before like all the screen sharing tools. And so a customer literally took out a piece of paper and drew for me what they saw on the screen with a paper and a <laughs> pen and they faxed it to me. They just spent hours, you know, it's just like technology has come such a, such oh a long God. way. And I felt terrible. There was amazing shading art on this uh, thing that they had drawn. Maybe this they were an artist created for me it was it was very very impressive but i but i felt bad that they'd uh they'd spent so much spent so much time on that oh my god <laughs> but 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 some of the things i mean you, you've you've gone into practices and when you fully automate them like this uh and, and you automate the payments and you you automate the workflow i mean uh they can improve their profitability right yeah yeah absolutely i mean the you know, hygiene in the practice is the is the lifeblood, and and if you're not seeing patients for hygiene, your opportunity to present them with treatment goes down. And, and even if you bring them back in, if there's that lag, right? If you if your standard of care is six months and you're only seeing them every eleven, right? There's there's a big opportunity that's that's missed there, and so it can be a huge. You know, it's not just about the technology; it's about the results it can it can provide for you. And um, so, yeah. All right. Well, listen. Do you, do you have any other uh, any, any other pearls for our listeners? We're coming to the end of our podcast, I think, and uh, these are the five uh, five things that we think you should automate, uh, and that maybe you're not. And, and, and I will I will also share, doctors, is is this again? It is hard to change. It really is hard to change. But you know, maybe you're in your practice. You're coming out of this COVID thing. You're just maybe a little down. Like you know, all of us, this has been a tough, tough year for everybody. And, and, and here's a new thing that you might be able to embrace. And, and if you have people in your practice that are dinosaurs that won't change anything, uh, you're either going to continue to practice the way you're practicing or you're not going to, you know, or, or, or you're going to get rid of them. But if you have young people or people that really like new things and like new challenges, I mean, some of the things we've talked about today, the online booking and the online payments, uh, and the 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 digital workflow and the routing sheets, you know, these are all things. If you're doing all this, that's great. Kudos to you. If you're not doing this, um, you know, take a look. What, whatever solution you use, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Dentrix Ascend is a great solution. Whatever you're going to do, do something, please, right, Daniel? Do yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, I and mean, just, uh, you don't have to do it all at once, right? Pick one, pick one thing that you're going to improve, make the goal and, and start making that change this week. You know, um, it, pick one thing. You don't have to change it all at once. Exactly. One more time, Daniel. And by the way, great information today. Really appreciate your time. Um, how do folks get a hold of you? Uh, uh, email and a phone number. And we'll have that in the show notes. Yeah, Daniel dot Larson, L A R S E N at Henry Shine One dot com. And you can call me anytime, 801 833 3744. Yeah, and Daniel will help you with any of your questions or you're not sure how to do something. Uh, so I want to thank you. Hang on. Uh, I got a couple things to, to finish up our show. Again, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for. Uh, the privilege of listen, listening to, uh, to to you listening to me. I guess I'm privileged to have you listen to me. Yeah, that's how that works. Okay, I said that right. Um, <laughs> our podcast is growing again; just keeps growing. We get more and more people uh, calling and emailing, and and we really appreciate. It. Please keep the emails and everything coming. Uh, you can email me at uh, a Wiederman at idbailey dot com. And one thing I uh, I keep forgetting to mention at the beginning, but I want to mention it too is um, we actually published uh, today on the internet our um, web, uh, our, our podcast on the research and development tax credit. And this is a really great tax credit, folks, that has become more prevalent uh, for dental practices. And we have a whole group at Ide Bailey, 27 people 
uh, that that do that. So you want to listen to the podcast from the 16th. Uh, we're going to talk all about that. But if you think that you've done some new innovations, new product design, maybe use some new materials, new methods. This is a very liberal, and I'm not talking politics, folks. This is a very liberal tax credit. So what you want to do is go onto our website, which is www.eidbailey, which is E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y forward slash dental, D-E-N-T-A-L-R-D. And that'll bring you to information about the Research and Development Income Tax Credit. And this tax credit, uh, what you can do is fill out a questionnaire. It might take you five or 10 minutes to fill it out. You push a button, it'll go to our R&D team, and then we'll get a hold of you and talk to you more about what you're doing in your practice to see what you can do. This could save you thousands and thousands of dollars every single year if you're doing these these procedures, and you can actually go back and amend tax returns. So this is something that I'm really jumping on for our clients, and we're coming up on our year-end meetings with our clients. We meet with all of our clients, uh, as do all of our members, uh, folks at I Bailey, and all the members of the Academy of Dental CPAs. This is the most important year for any of you to get into your accountant, and if your accountant doesn't do that, if they don't do year-end meetings, call me. Call me, please, 657-279-3243. Call a member of the Academy of Dental CPAs. Call us at IBL. We are all here to help you. So anyway, Daniel, I want to thank you so much for your time and your expertise. Uh, Henry Schein, I, I got a lot of friends at Henry Schein that I've known <laughs> for many, many years. Um, uh, they, they, they've bought me uh, many adult beverages. Not too many, but some. <laughs> enough. Uh, they've been a supporter of the Academy of Dental CPAs. I had a chance once to lecture at their national uh, sales meeting in uh, at their home office in Milwaukee, and that was really fun. So anyway, thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you, Art. All right, and everyone, please continue to listen to the podcast. Tell your friends about it. Um, we're, we're, like I say, we're growing by leaps and bounds, and we've got great, you know, financial and management uh, uh, topics and guests coming up. And as soon as the government decides if and when they're going to do something, uh, I will be the first one to tell you. And if they do nothing, I'm just going to do one podcast for like 60 minutes. That's just going to say they did nothing. They did nothing. They did nothing. I'm going to say that for 60 minutes because I'm so <laughs> frustrated at this whole darn process. Well, anyway, everyone, this is Art Wiederman. That's it for this edition of the Art of Dental Finance and Management with Art Wiederman CPA. Thank you for listening and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to today's episode of the Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you never miss an episode. The Art of Dental Finance and Management podcast is produced by Ide Bailey in partnership with Art Wiederman, CPA, Decisions in Dentistry Magazine, and the Academy of Dental CPAs. For audience questions and feedback, email Art Wiederman, awiederman at idebailey.com. That's A-W-I-E-D-E-R-M-A-N at E-I-D-E-B-A-I-L-L-Y.com. Or you may call Art at 657-279-3243.